And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in ayah number 34, وَمَا جَعَلْنَا لِبَشَرٍ مِّنْ قَبْلِكَ الْخُلْدِ أَفَإِمْ مِتَّ فَهُمُ الْخَالِدُونَ Have we not ordained perpetual life for any human being? We have not ordained perpetual life for any human being before you. So if you die, will they live forever? Now, here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is essentially consoling the Prophet. Because one of the things that the mushrikeen used to do is that, and Allah mentions this in uh, Surah At-Tur, Surah 52, Ayah number 20. أَمْ يَقُولُونَ شَاعِرٌ نَتَرَبَّصُ بِهِ رَيْبَ الْمَنُونَ The mushrikeen, the Quraysh, they didn't take the Prophet seriously. They thought that he was just a poet and he has this fan base. He has these followers and they basically said that he's a poet. Let us just wait until he dies, right? Let us wait until something horrible happens to him, until a misfortune. Because you have to, you have to remember that poets in 7th century Arabia were the equivalent of entertainers. You know, when you think about Hollywood celebrities, what typically happens to people that live, that are famous, that are, you know, uh, that are movie stars, that are celebrities? A lot of them, they, they die very tragic deaths, right? A lot of them, you know, for example, Robin Williams, famous actor, famous Hollywood star, he took his own life. A lot of them die from drug overdose because, you know, the, you know their skill becomes, you know, their, their poison. You know, when, when you have a skill and it's not connected to God and it's devoid of spirituality, you will end up suffering through as a result of your talent. So they were hoping that the Prophet would die. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that, and they, they would also say that if, so if you remember that they, the mushrikeen, they rejected the prophet because they said, why doesn't God send an angel? You know, you're just a human being. And then they would say that, okay, if you're tr truly a prophet, if you're a human prophet, then you shouldn't die. You should live forever. So here Allah says, we have not ordained perpetual life for any human being before you. That no human being is going to live forever. And Amir al-Mu'mineen in, in, in a hadith, he says, just about, he speaks about the mortality of the human being. If anyone could ascend the ladder of eternal life, or was able to repel death, it would have been Sulaiman, the son of Dawood, the one whom human beings and jinn were made subservient to. So he, he had the dunya and the akhra. He was a king. He had the jinn under his control. He had all of this power, but even Sulaiman died. And then Allah says to them that, we have not we have or we have not ordained perpetual life for any human being before you. So if you die, well, are they gonna live forever? So they're waiting for you to die. Don't they realize that they also are gonna die? You're also gonna die. And then Allah says in the next verse, Kullu nafsin Every soul shall taste death. We try you with evil and with good as a test, and to us you shall return. Every nafs, the word nafs in the Arabic language is a very deep word. You know, the word nafs, you know, when a woman bleeds after a child, after she delivers a baby, you know, this post, uh, po this post, uh, 
the, the postnatal, the, after she delivers uh, the postnatal bleeding, we refer to a woman who has experienced postnatal bleeding and nufasa, from the same word as nafs, to bleed out. Nafas, so look at all the words that are associated, associated with nafs. Nafas means to, to breathe. So every living thing, everything that has life, whether it's an animal, a human being, a plant, everything will experience, will taste death. Now it's interesting that Allah uses the word taste. Usually when you, when you use the word taste, you mention what, what something will taste like. Allah doesn't mention what death will taste like. He says everyone is going to die. Everyone will taste death. But there is no mention of whether or not death will be sweet or bitter. Allah doesn't mention it. Why? Because people will experience death differently. We're all going to taste it. For some, death will be sweet. For others, death will be bitter. And Allah uses the active participle, ذَائِقَةُ الْمَوْتِ ذَائِقَةُ الْمَوْتِ Some of the Mufassireen, they say that the ayah is not only saying that every soul shall taste death, Every meaning they shall taste death when they completely die and become lifeless. In fact, at every moment, you and I are tasting death. Every moment. Why? Because at every moment, your life, if you think of your lifespan as a cup of water, right? And death. Death is actually the opposite of life. And the opposite of life is to be lifeless, to be without life. So if you think of your lifespan as a cup of water, with every breath you take, it's being decreased. So we are dying, we are experiencing moat at every second. Meaning that when you are born, the process of death has already begun. The process of death has already begun because Amir al he says, every step you take, every breath you take is a step closer to death, the state of lifelessness. And when you become completely lifeless, that is the ultimate death, right? Because Allah says, when he speaks about uh, the creation of the human being, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says that, you know, كَيْفَ تَكْفُرُونَ بِاللَّهِ How can you reject God? وَكُنْتُمْ أَمْوَاتًا فَأَحْيَاكُمْ How can you reject God when you were amwat, you were in a state of moat, and then Allah gave you life? Can we say, you know, before we were born, were we dead? No, we weren't dead. We were just lifeless. We were lifeless. And Allah gave us life. So moat is actually a state of lifelessness. You know, sleep is a lesser death. Meaning that when we're asleep, we're, we're lifeless. We're, we resemble lifelessness. كُلُّ نَفْسٍ ذَائِقَةُ الْمَوْتِ Every soul shall taste death. And as I mentioned, the way death tastes is not mentioned because everyone experiences death differently. There, uh, there is a hadith from Imam Zain al-Abideen where he speaks about the difference between the death of a mu'min and the death of a kafir. So he speaks about the two extremes. Someone who has iman and someone who has knowingly rejected the truth. The Imam says, Lil mu'min, for a mu'min, death is like 
قملا وفك قيود وأغلال ثقيلة والاستبدال بأفخر الثياب ويطيبها روائح إمام زين العابدين he says for a believer death the way death feels it feels like removing dirty raggedy clothes and it feels like removing shackles and chains and replacing them with the most lavish, comfortable garments. So it feels like death for a moment. It feels, it almost feels like you're a bird that's trapped in a cage and you have so much potential to fly and the gate is open and you get to soar. Death is a, it's a type of liberation for the, the mu'min because the, the mu'min is able to do so much, but it, the mu'min is limited by the physical body. So there's, a, there's a, a sense of liberation with death. Whereas the kafir, walil kafir, bin fakhira, for a kafir, it's the opposite. It's like taking off comfortable, lavish, opulent clothing and wearing raggedy clothes, rough, coarse clothing. And it's like moving from a, a place of comfort to a place of grief and misery. So the experience is different. كُلُّ نَفْسٍ ذَائِقَةُ الْمَوْتِ And then Allah says, وَنَبْلُوكُمْ بِالشَّرِّ وَالْخَيْرِ The reason why we gave you life to begin with is because we, 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 we try you, we will try you with evil, and with good. What does it mean when Allah says we will try you with evil and with good? It's because many of us, we think that when I'm poor, Allah is testing me. When I'm sick, Allah is testing me. When I lose my job, Allah is testing me. Allah says, yes, I test you through, you know, what you think is evil, what you deem to be a misfortune. But I also test you with khair. When you're healthy, you're being tested. When you have money, you're also being tested. When you get promoted, you're being tested. So everyone in, is in a state of bala. You know, sometimes we think that Allah is testing the people who are suffering in Yemen and in Syria and in other Afghanistan, we think that they are the ones who are in bala. They're, Allah is putting them through ibtila. No. We are both in a state of ibtila. It's just that our test is different. And some of us were failing miserably in our test. We're, we don't show Allah gratitude when we're healthy. We don't remember Him in our times of ease. We do not use our wealth to improve the lives of others. We become obsessed and attached to this material world. So the one who is living in comfort is being tested as much as the one who is living a life of poverty and sickness. And you may think that that is a more difficult test. To live in poverty and sickness is more difficult. The answer is actually no. It might be, it might be more bitter, but you have a higher chance of passing that test. And that's why you see that throughout history, most people have been tested through poverty and sickness. Whereas you only have a handful of people who are multi-billionaires. That's a very difficult test to pass. Because you see, it's very rare that you find someone who's very wealthy and who's mu'min. Many people fail that test. But you see a lot of mu'mineen who are poor, who are destitute, who are ill. The test of wealth and health is actually more challenging than the test of poverty and sickness. And therefore Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He gives us a trial 
He gives us try, and, and some of us, you know, we're going to be happy that Allah tested us in the way that He tests us. You know, sometimes we wish for things, we wish for wealth and success, but believe me, brothers and sisters, that's a very slippery slope. And Allah has given wealth and power to many people, and the majority of them have failed. Because there's something about wealth and power and prestige that brings out the worst in people. So it's better to, to struggle and be uncomfortable in this dunya for a temporary period of time and gain that eternal life rather than just live it up and enjoy in this dunya and make you forgetful. Now again, if you're, if you're able to pass the trial of wealth and health, more power to you. But we should also trust in Allah's wisdom that when we do our best and we're still not able to get out of these hardships, perhaps it's better for you. It's better for you that Allah doesn't give you too much wealth. Perhaps it's good that Allah afflicts you with these misfortunes because it's the only way for you to be grounded. It's the only way for you to remain humble. It's, it's the only way for you to continue to strengthen your relationship with Allah. You know, most of us, when do we make our, our most sincere du'as? Oftentimes when our hearts are broken, when we're sick, when we lose our jobs, that's when we turn to Allah wholeheartedly and we recite the most sincere supplications and our, our tears are streaming from our eyes. Most likely, we're not going to be reciting with that fervor if Allah never gave us any problems, if we just lived carefree and we had millions in our bank accounts. So Allah says, It's a fitna, it's a test, it's a trial. And to us you shall return. You will return to Allah and Allah will judge you on how you reacted to his blessings and how you reacted to misfortune. You know, sometimes we don't have control over what we experience in life, but we have control over how we respond. We have control of, over our attitudes, how we re react to shar and khair. We ask Allah Azza wa to bless us and guide us and illuminate our hearts with the teachings of Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad wa akhir da'wana and alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen wa sallallahu ala Muhammad wa alihi al-tahirin Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad